Who has an interest or who has an impact on document accessibility at your organization? Well, I know you guys do. Okay, good. Um, so uh, you'll notice that uh, it doesn't say, well, it says R. Donnelly down here, but it doesn't say R. Donnelly in our tagline anymore because we rebranded not too long ago. Um, so uh, hopefully everybody knows who R. Donnelly is, but I'll take just a couple minutes to do the quick uh, commercial to show that uh, we actually do uh, we're in the industry and that kind of thing. So, um, but um, we are not the Yellow Pages, all right? So I don't know how many times I get that over the years. Oh yeah, the Yellow Pages. No, no, no. We've never done the Yellow Pages. Uh, we used to print phone books, but I don't think that uh, phone books really exist much anymore. So we don't print. Uh, actually, we spun that group off uh, last fall anyway. So. Um, but I'm the Director of Solutions Development, uh, and as Skip said, specifically for healthcare, although uh, my history goes uh, way back. Uh, it's very possible that I've actually spoken to some of you um, in, the room, in the room before, because I think I've had interaction with a lot of your, uh, with a lot of your companies at various times. But um, currently healthcare, and that's where I've been exposed to uh, this whole concept of uh, accessibility. So. Um, just uh, real quick, uh, in terms of what Donnelly does, if you're not familiar, uh, create, manage, deliver, optimize in the communication space. And the reason I put that up there is I expect that a lot of you know that already. But the couple things that are really important there are the create and the deliver, especially when it comes to accessibility. So on that create side, where we sit relative to our customers, uh, there is a better than average chance that we have some involvement in the creation of the documents that we produce. Uh, we do have quite a few customers that also create their own documents and then they send them to us and we produce and, and uh, print and mail. But well over 50% of those, we are actually, we have our hands in the creation process. And so um, the whole idea of where accessibility occurs, very important in that create side. And then the deliver side is really where uh, the user is accessing those documents. Uh, and if we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about non-print access to documents. And so the deliver part of this is really important as well. Um, the areas that, uh, that we play in, uh, you know, the, the only reason I wanted to put that up there really is if you look over at the industry solutions on the right, um, you start looking for those ones that have very high regulatory needs, uh, really high consumer touch points, and so we really do play in every industry uh, where accessibility is, uh, is, is important. Okay, so um, that is that. Uh, so a little bit more about me. The first thing, and um, <laughs> you're probably thinking, why am I here? Um, I am not a regulatory expert on accessibility, right? So if you came and because you wanted to know all about WCAG and PDFUA and what CMS says and what uh, the, eight, the Americans with Disability Act says, I am not a regulatory expert, right? So there might be some people in the room that know uh, more about that than I do. So, but that's okay because I've got a lot of experience in the industry itself in working on creating documents and I've got a lot of experience really just over the last several years in accessibility use cases with our customers. So I've been a little bit in the trenches as that whole thing goes and so, um, but if you, have the, if, you have, if you have questions about regulatory, go ahead and ask, and I might know anyway. Uh, but what we are going to be talking about is accessibility from a document perspective, not from a browser or a website perspective. So that's what this morning's about. So again, if you got questions on, you know, how do I get, what's the best screen reader, and what's the best browser for that stuff? I don't know that stuff either. But again, if you ask the question, maybe somebody in the audience knows. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and I promised you that uh, since I didn't have an agenda that uh, I would talk about an agenda. So we're going to do basically two things. We're going to talk about the accessibility challenge. Actually, we're going to spend most of our time talking about why is accessibility so hard. And then we're going to spend some time at the end talking about how you can uh, mitigate some of those things. Uh, but that's, that's basically the agenda. But we are going to spend most of our time talking about um, the, the difficulties and why things are what they are. So we're going to start with a little use case here. Um, so there's a company. Uh, name starts with R, ends in D. And this company 
wants to create a brochure, and uh, I call this a simple use case. Okay, so they want to create a brochure, six-page brochure, talks about, oh, talks about uh, security and compliance in the healthcare space. I have no idea who that company might be. Um, uh, and they've got a marketing group that creates this using InDesign. Okay, so they, somebody writes the brochure, they get it to their marketing group, they want to create this, uh, this brochure, six-pager, and um, the destination is important as well because ultimately what they want to do is they're going to print a couple thousand of these, they're going to distribute them to a trade show, maybe to some sales reps, and then they're going to post this document on their website. And let's just say that they've got uh, a, a pretty big audience that might, and some of those people might have issues with, uh, with site and, and uh, reviewing printed documents or documents on a screen. So in this case, the great thing about this is that this, this is not what we're going to be talking about because this is what I consider to be pretty simple. Okay, so your marketing department uses InDesign. If they know what they're doing, they can create a tag document right out of InDesign. You post it to your website. You're done. Um, but this is not why we're here because that is, that's a relatively simple use case. Now this use case though is why we're here. So uh, let's talk for a couple minutes about what this means. So in this case, we've got a kit and the kit has three components in it. But they're not just any three components. So these three components are, this is a healthcare kit. Okay, so this is this is what I know a lot about uh, in, in recent history. And among these three documents, this one on the right, pretty simple. There's one version of it. But those two on the left, there are several hundred versions of each of those that are plan specific and they're specific to, they're not specific to the user, but they are very product and plan specific. And so there's a lot of work that goes into the development of, these are two or 300 page documents. They're basically contracts. And those documents, there's hundreds of versions of them, and let's say, just for instance, that all three of these documents are created in three different systems. And we'll talk a little bit more about systems in a little bit. But three different systems create these, three, potentially three different companies or three different departments within a company, all creating these different documents, and Look at the destination. So we're going to print, let's say they've got 100,000 members. It's open enrollment season. We're going to print 100,000 of each of these pieces. We're going to kit them together, and we're going to distribute them out via the mail. Pretty simple. We do it all, all the time. But where this thing gets a little bit tricky is that we need to make all of those variations of those documents available on the, the healthcare plan's website. Now, what gets tricky about that is that each of these documents, again, created from different users, and how are you going to display that document on the website? Are you going to... What's that? <laughs> They're a valued customer. Well, that's okay. That's okay, because it doesn't have to have their name on it, but what it does have to do, it's got to reflect the actual product that they bought. So when they log in and they want to see this kit, the system's got to know which version of those two documents they get, and um, it's got to it's got to be tagged for accessibility, right? Or or they're not going to be compliant. So that is our challenge for this morning, and how you how you how you have to deal with something like that. So um, the current situation, uh, I I put this together just based on my experience. You might see things a little bit differently, but if you start over here on the right hand side. Um, the companies that we deal with kind of fall into these four categories. The first one is there are companies that are completely ignoring accessibility. And it is true, even companies that should not be. Right? So there's some companies that are primarily B2B where you can kind of say, well, that kind of makes sense. It's not going to be the top of mind for them. But there are consumer-oriented companies that are completely ignoring accessibility, um, which is somewhat dangerous. Um, the second one here is that there are other companies that uh, do this on demand basically when they need to. So they get a request from a customer or potential customer, and they want to see a document, or they want to get an accessible version of a document. And so what they do is they just simply wait until they get a request, and then they take that document, they send it to an outside vendor who remediates it, tags it, checks it, and then sends it back, and they send it to the consumer. Now imagine that. 
you're doing basically a custom document for anybody that requests it. The third one in the green is that there are companies that have done a pretty good job of doing this for some of their documents, but not all of their documents. And so they've put the effort into uh, putting a nice process in place, and they're solid for half their business. But then they've got other parts where they, they produce documents that are just not, not in compliance. And then you've got the fourth one up here where all the documents are compliant. That's kind of the, that's kind of the unicorn. I, I, haven't, I haven't found one of those yet, but I'm sure that they're out there somewhere. Probably a smaller company that doesn't have uh, a lot of effort behind doing it. So that's kind of where people are on the, on the continuum. So this is where we're going to spend uh, the bulk of our time, which is trying to define what's the problem. Um, I, generally, when, I, when I'm in front of customers, I like to talk a lot about solutions, but today's probably, it's probably a little bit better to talk about where the problems are because um, it's easier to, I, I think this, this issue has a lot of opaqueness to it to a lot of people. It did for me at first as well. And so we're going to go over each of these six items in some, uh, in some level of detail and to get at that question of where's the problem. Um, so the first one is this idea of an unclear target. And uh, this really is kind of the beginning of the whole process because if you go and ask any company and you ask somebody that deals with documents, there's a good chance that they're not going to have, let's call it an enterprise-wide view or decision on what accessibility means to them and how uh, how much they need to really, uh, they really need to, um, uh, to do something about it. And so um, what I call it is balancing compliance and the need for compliance with the, uh, uh, the real world. And you think about some of these questions like, okay, so what standards do I even use? I, we hear this all the time. Because if you're in, even if you're in a regulated industry, like healthcare, like finance, it isn't obvious what standards you should use. Because if you've got a regulator and that regulator talks about needing to have accessible documents, well, that regulator might mention that you need to be able to provide, I mean, it might be one sentence. You need to be able to provide, you need to provide documents that are accessible. The end. That might be all there is. Now, they might mention that, you know, um, we recommend that you look here, you look there, but in most cases, Regulators don't have this big laundry list of things that you need to do this, you need to do this, and if you don't do these 10 things, you're going to get fined. They just basically say, you need to do it. So this whole idea is, uh, is how do I know, how do I know what's good enough? That's really where a lot of this comes down. And we'll talk more about good enough a little bit later when we get into some solutions, but that's really what a lot of our customers really come down to, is they need to figure out among themselves what's good enough for accessibility, okay? Um, so unclear target is the first one. The second one here is um, the impact of being accessible versus uh, the number of actual requests that they get. And this is another thing that, it doesn't really get verbalized directly, but it, it does come up that uh, they look at all the documents they produce, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of documents, and they think, we only get a handful of requests a year for this. How do I balance that out? How, how, do I, how do I completely reshape all of my, my document production if I only get a handful of requests per year? Um, and you think about the impact of this, because this is something that you know, we store a lot of document images for our customers, a lot, billions and billions and billions. And um, when we talk about accessible documents and making, uh, storing accessible documents and making those available through the customer's website or through a hosted site that, that we provide, well, one of the things that our developers tell us is that if you make a document accessible, depending on how complex that document is, it can balloon the size of that, of that document up to 20%. So if you're storing billions and billions of documents, your incremental storage starts going like this. Um, not just that, but it can also, depending on how you do it, it can also increase the, uh, the complexity of how you create that document and the turn times. Um, or you can just, skip all that stuff and you can perform manual requests like we talked about a minute ago. Right? So the, but even those are expensive and they're time consuming. Remediating something every time somebody wants an accessible document. So this idea of impact versus the, the actual request is a huge thing that weighs on 
our customers' minds. Does that, does that make sense? And um, we're going to have plenty of time here, so go ahead and ask questions if you have them when we're going through this stuff. So um, I'm, I haven't, uh, I don't have a, I, I don't have a great script here that uh, where you're going to take me off of, uh, off of my train of thought. So. Um, so those are the first two items. So remember, we're talking about what's the problem and what causes all this stuff. So those are two huge issues um, that we need to talk about. So the, the next one here, um, you're going to start seeing that some of, these, some of the next few are kind of interconnected. Um, and the first one is this idea of the design disconnect. Um, you've probably all been through this. And this is the thing when, when a customer wants to talk about accessibility or when we bring up the subject. We always start with talking about design. Because if you don't design a document correctly from the beginning, it doesn't eliminate the ability to add accessibility, but it does, it can make it much more difficult to be compliant. Um, and so this improper design uh, can really reduce that ability to pass any type of, any type of testing. And um, the, the reason that this happens is that that conversation isn't happening for far enough upstream. So you've got marketing, you've got designers, whether they're inside, whether they're outside, and they need to be part of that conversation. They need to be told up front that we're gonna make these accessible. Um, but it doesn't really end there either because um, they're either not aware of the, um, uh, the parameters that the company set, or they really don't, the designer doesn't know anything about accessibility at all. Because think about it, if they're using InDesign, they can easily perform the function within InDesign to add, to make that document accessible. But that doesn't mean that, they've, uh, that they have designed the document and laid it out in a way that's going to make logical sense to a screen reader. So they think the document looks great, they add the tagging, they output it, and then somebody goes to test it on a screen reader and it reads all out of order. It doesn't understand certain images. It can't read the table. And so they've, they've completely messed it up. And so um, th this design issue is, is critical. And um, if you look at that last bullet outside of the, the, marketing, uh, the marketing refresh, think about um, you've got, they've just gone through a rebranding. They've redone all of their materials in their websites. And then they, they send a document out to have it become part of, I don't know, a kit production or something like that. And they realize that that document doesn't meet requirements for accessibility, doesn't read right, even though it's tagged. Well, they've got to change that, but how do they change it? How do they change it if, they're going to ch if when they change it, it, it no longer meets their brand guidelines? It no longer looks like the other things that they did, right? So doing this stuff outside of a brand refresh can be difficult as well. This is my favorite one. And so this is the slide where there's a mistake. Does anybody see the mistake in the slide? What is it? HP Extreme. That's correct. So I was looking at this last night and I thought, oh. Uh, it took me years to call it HP Extreme to begin with. And it's going to take me years to stop calling it that. And so hopefully there's nobody here from, from open text. Uh, but I didn't change it because I thought that would be funny. Um, so. Uh, this, this, is my, this is my favorite one because we experience this ourselves as a vendor. And that's this idea of multiple composition tools. And so as a service provider, we have an ungodly number of composition engines and creative tools in our company. Uh, but regular companies that aren't in the uh, communications business also have this problem. So what I did, I put together this little chart here to give you just kind of an idea of, I, I, what I did is I merged a couple of real life examples here that I knew of to kind of give a sense of what this might look like. And so this is our, this is our fictional client, Acme Corp. And this is what they have within their organization. So like a lot of organizations, they have InDesign, right? So you're a market, you have a marketing group, you have creative people, you're gonna have InDesign. And, um, but, and that's okay because InDesign, really good at supporting accessibility and tagging. You know, if you know, if you have a designer that knows how to do it. Um, then, on the op side, in IT, uh, and I don't know, maybe they're producing some type of monthly or annual personalized high volume document out to all their consumers, all their customers. So they've got Extreme, and that's good too, because Extreme uh, supports uh, tagging 
as a native function right out of the tool. So that's good. So they're good there. Um, but now we start getting into some of the problems because this company also has a legacy billing system where it was written in 1985 using COBOL and they have not replaced it. Why haven't they replaced it? Who wants to take a guess? Because they don't have anybody around. They all retired. They're gone. They're gone. And finding people that know that is, is not only dangerous or, or is hard, but it's also dangerous because that code has been added onto for so long and it works and nobody wants to touch it. What's the chance that that COBOL program has accessibility tagging in it? <laughs> Zero. All right, so that's bad. Um, they also, I don't know what kind of company this is, but this company also has a storefront where you can come online and you can, uh, you can create uh, communication pieces. And they did this using PageFlex. So they tied PageFlex into their storefront. Uh, they built templates and now they can do all this cool stuff, but PageFlex doesn't support tagging natively. Bad again. Um, and then this last one I thought I'd throw in because I think it's kind of funny that there are these little departments that you would never ever think of, that, that these little instances that happen in a company, like text forms. So we'll use the example of W-2s. So a company decides they want to start making their W-2s available to their employees, and they would like for those W-2s to be accessible. Well, that's a problem because they use a little software package that um, is good at doing text forms, but they call, the, they call the, the company and they say, oh, we want to be able to make these documents accessible. They have no idea what that means. We're a tax form company. That's all we do. And so now they want to, they want to make their W-2s available online, but they can't tag them. So that's the situation that we have in a lot of companies. And that's what ends up, that's what ends up hurting uh, the ability to be able to meet uh, accessibility requirements. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely, and how many of those types of applications are out there? And there's so many, they're all over the place. Um, good for people like Crawford because they get to sell lots of transform tools to be able to make sense out of the crap. But, um, but anyway, that's, that's, the, um, th that's, kind of the big, that's kind of the big issue. But it doesn't really end there because we've got a couple other ones here to go through. And the next one here, and again, I mentioned before that these are kind of interrelated. Um, and the multiple uh, creative and creation points is, is kind of related to that last one. But this is more about how many places do they have within and without, outside of the organization that produces documents. So uh, you know, our customers, we deal, we typically deal with lots of big, uh, big clients. And we're not their only vendor. They've got lots of internal departments that produce documents. They've got lots of vendors that produce documents. And so these multiple touch points are, are really difficult to, uh, to deal with because now, uh, we talked about the multiple internal departments um, uh, and, and their vendors, their vendors all have varying degrees of, of capabilities. Um, I, I'm not sure why this is. I, it's, it's a big question, I think, in our industry generally, but how are there still so many little printers across the country? Mm -hmm. And, but there are. And they do a great job, and they do a great job, actually, not just for little companies, they do a great job for big companies. And, um, but they don't know much about accessibility, right? So if you've got, this is all these vendors out there, thousands and thousands of printers and other types of service bureaus that really don't know much about this, um, about this topic. And you look at that last point there on the left-hand side, and it kind of feeds into the next section, which is that oftentimes, the output from these different areas somehow need, they need to come together. The example that I gave at the outset here of, of that healthcare kit or something like that where you've got documents that are produced from four or five different sources but they need to somehow come together in an experience on a website and uh, need to be accessible. And the chance of that being a consistent experience is pretty low when it comes from all those different vendors. 
And that's kind of what this, this digital kidding example is about, is what would this experience actually look like? So we took an example here. We start out with four documents. And there might be 100 versions of one. There might only be one version of another. And the goal here is to try to make sure that these documents can be uh, presented online effectively, just as they are in print as a kit. Um, and so the, the challenge here is, OK, so how do you present that? And there's a couple of different options here that the user can access. Um, and we've all seen this. So you go online, and uh, you want to see like a welcome kit uh, using Matt's example. I, I'm, AT&T, uh, uh, telecoms like that, or banks, they're all very good at providing you an option for seeing your welcome experience completely online and not getting print. Um, and so in that case, think about all the different pieces that you might have access to see. And they can give you two ways to do that. They can give you kind of like a table of contents that says, I want to see my terms and conditions, I want to see my welcome, I want to see any kind of forms. And you click on one and you get taken to that experience. The other way they can do it is they can combine all those pieces into one document for Steve and have Steve just leaf through that one document. In both of those cases, this is still a huge problem because if these documents are already tagged, we've got three tagged and one not tagged. Remember, they all came from four different sources, source systems. Well, if I try to combine all those into a single document, a single PDF to, to display online, what happens? The tagging all gets corrupted because it doesn't know how to talk to, it, it doesn't use the same type of tagging. So at that point, it's no longer accessible. Or if they use a table of contents type structure where you can click on any document you want, we still might have a problem because the tagging process and the way that those documents were designed may not be consistent, which delivers an inconsistent experience every time that user clicks another document. So this idea of, this, I, I, I wanted to make sure I added this one because this is the one that's really kind of often overlooked when, we, when I talk to uh, other people about accessibility because you think, okay, well, we've tagged everything, we're good. Well, you may not be. So this is, another use, this is another use case about why we can have problems. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the healthcare, you know, especially, I mean, you've got welcome kits, but then you've got, for example, I think it's the reason why digital printers exist. The healthcare plan looks at, for example, like formularies, as let's get it done as cheaply as possible. So we'll go with, we'll send a bid out to do, these, to do this formulary, and they do it to the cheapest possible person that year. And of course, what they get back is paper. They don't make anything in their contract about giving back some kind of document source that I can then push back in to the system for the accessibility. And That's right, because they're still very print, they're still very print-centric in the way that they think. Um, the good thing is, you know, in healthcare and in, in, the, in financial services, some of these documents get so complex that really they need to go to a much smaller subset of sources to create the document. And they, then they can go to other sources to be able to print it. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I think you're exactly right. So um, those, are, those are kind of the, the, the problem. And so um, now I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about, OK, so if those are the problems, then how do we deal with those? And the first thing is um, to create a, uh, create a corporate target. And this is, I, I found this really interesting the first time I got exposed to this because it's a little bit, I don't know, I, it, I was a bit shocked, I think, to see that a company was taking this, tact, this tactic, but others have done it as well. And, and so what I mean by that is that um, defining an, what I call an acceptable standard that comes as close as possible, as close as they believe they can, to what are out there as industry standards like PDFUA. Um, and the reason that this is important is that it, this gets back to that comment I made earlier about the real world and living in the real world. They don't live in a perfect world where they can redesign all their documents at one time, make them all perfectly accessible. It doesn't happen that way. It happens iteratively over time. And so they need to make compromises with standards. And what, what they need to end up doing is they need, to review, they need to create that set of standards that they believe they can live with, a minimum set of standards that will allow them to be accessible 
and to say that they can provide accessible documents to their, their users that have site issues. But at the same time, they've got to realize that they can't be perfect um, in a lot of cases. And so review those with accessibility experts, review those with their compliance and legal, get to the point where there's agreement within the enterprise of what accessibility means to them. And then publish those standards. Get them to the designers, get them to the vendors. This document right here is an example of one of those from one of our customers. Um, and I cleaned it up a lot, so you can't, it's just Acme. But um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a really interesting piece on this document. It's, it's here in the middle on the right-hand side, and it says, ignore the errors that are known bugs or not required by us. So what happens when you check something for accessibility? You run it through a process like JAWS or Adobe's got their own uh, accessibility checker. And inevitably, almost inevitably, you're going to get some kind of error out of these accessibility checkers because very few documents at, at first blush are perfect. But they're, they're, they're understanding, they're kind, of, they're kind of just conceding the fact that there are some things that we are just not going to require that a screen, that, that a screen uh, an accessibility checker is going to find. And we're just going to say, you know what, we can't do anything about that. And so they write it into these specs and say, if you get that error, ignore it. And then the, other, the first part of the comment, known bugs. Um, so things that an accessibility checker might not like that they believe are still, uh, are still uh, appropriate. So creating this document and getting it out to everybody that needs to, to see it is really important. And it's, it's not just important for, to have it in the hands of the people that are going to be doing the work, but it shows that the company has actually thought about it and have made conscious decisions about how they're going to deal with accessibility. Um, the second thing is, uh, and this one might seem, this is the most obvious, I think, of all of them, is that uh, the industry really needs to require tagging uh, capability for the composition or creative engines that they have. Um, in most cases, not necessarily all cases, but in most cases, um, generating a document already tagged is the, most, is, it's the best option to do. Right? So uh, right off the bat, when you create that document, it's tagged, you've checked it, you've checked the format, it's accessible, it's ready to go. Um, and we'll talk about an instance where that might not be the case, but basically that's a rule of thumb. And so when you think about internal, uh, internally they need to, to change their procurement processes. So um, they need to require any new software purchase for, for creation have the ability to, to, to set tags. Uh, if it doesn't support accessibility, then they shouldn't really be doing it. They shouldn't really be getting it. Um, or look and see if an existing engine can be upgraded. Um, some of them, uh, I think there was one that I had known about, I can't remember the name at this point, where accessibility was kind of an option to, to, to purchase no or yes. Um, most of the big engines have it natively, uh, GMC, uh, Extreme, it's, you just have to know how to use it. Um, but uh, but see, see if it can be upgraded. Uh, if it, uh, really, it, it really shouldn't be an option any longer. You know, there are a couple, there are a couple big tools out there like PageFlex where they just don't have any plans to support it, which is really kind of strange to me. Um, and then comparing that replacement cost versus uh, the manual labor and the potential compliance issues. And so what is it going to cost to actually replace an engine and rewrite the document program? What's it going to cost to do that versus uh, the trouble you could get in if you're not compliant. But then there's this whole vendor angle as well. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I think should be a best practice is that when a company comes out with an RFP for a document or a set of documents, it should require that they be accessible. It's pretty simple. If you've got a vendor that doesn't do that, they need to learn how to do it or you shouldn't use them. Um, require that capability for being on the approved vendor list. Um, and then looking at existing programs, you know, can it be, um, uh, can it be switched on? You know, oftentimes it's not quite as easy as just calling up your vendor and saying, hey, turn that switch on. I mean, it's a little bit harder than that, but effectively that's kind of what we're talking about. And, um, and then this idea of the cost of rewriting it, if, if you do, if the composition engine does uh, support accessibility, but the design is bad, what do you do? Got to rewrite it. 
and looking at the cost of that versus the potential client risk. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that assume that number two is not going to happen because it's just, it's too hard in many cases. So assume that that's going to fail. And what does that do? Um, well, that leaves you with a pretty slick option of considering an automated post-composition tagging engine. Um, so there are several of these available. Our friends at Crawford have one. Um, but there are several of these available. But this is really a neat feature uh, to be able to add to the toolbox because what it does is it allows you to set up a template, an environment that will take an already created PDF and it'll actually add tagging to it. It'll make it accessible. Now, there are, there are going to be limitations, right? So down at the bottom here, you can see that um, you're basically stuck with the existing design. You know, if you've already done the composition, you're not going to reflow it, you're not going to change it. So you're stuck with that design, but within that limitation, um, you can add uh, accessibility support um, post-composition. Um, and if you get the right one, uh, they can be pretty slick to work with. They can plug into an existing environment. They can be automated, drop a file off, get a file back as part of an automated workflow. So it doesn't, it doesn't really cause a huge disruption in the process. And the, where this comes into, into play, there's a couple different use cases here you can see. So adding tags to high volume documents that don't have them right now, right? So that's kind of the big number one use case. You got like that old COBOL thing. As long as it can produce a PDF, a postscript, a postscript PCL, <coughs> metacode, um, you know, if it does anything like that, then it can be, it can be converted to a format that could potentially uh, have tags added to it. Um, uh, and then this, the second bullet point is really kind of one of the really slick use cases that it can support um, doing this kind of on an on-demand basis. So um, if you want to create these documents, but you don't want to store them for your customers with all the tagging, but you want to support accessibility, what you can do is you can set up this process so that if a person comes onto a website and they request access to a document and you've got a way for them to request an accessible document, you can actually have that happen on demand. Now it's going to take longer for that, for that document to come up and for the screen reader to start, but you can actually do it on demand instead of storing documents that are accessible. We, we also have, um, I think it's been, we've shown I don't know that it has a huge impact, but we have people in, our print, in some of our print facilities that they don't want, they don't want to get uh, PDFs for pr print production if they've been tagged. And that's another reason why. So if you're, if you're potentially producing a print version of a document out of an archive, mm, you know, there's a, a school of thought that said that some printers are going to choke on those tags. So another reason why uh, on-demand, post-composition accessibility tagging. Pretty slick process. Um, and then the third one up there is the one that we just talked about in this whole digital kidding uh, uh, environment. So if you've got all these different documents that were produced in different, off a different composition engine, it can standardize that process of putting the tags in those and making them a single document. So it's a really, really good way to, uh, to fill out the toolbox. So those are kind of the three things that, um, you know, that, that I see that we've experienced. Um, that, Makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah. Look at all of these uh, accessibility uh, rules and that type of thing. In your opinion, is there such thing as somebody that's 100% compliant? Well, I think it's easy to be 100% compliant um, if you've got a very limited scope. And so, if you've got a uh, if you've got a um, a set of uh, customer facing materials and you only sell five products then it's between the between the brochures between your website it's pretty simple to become hundred percent compliant but it gets difficult very quickly the more that you expand beyond that because of the variety of different types of documents you believe most companies are compliant no in this area? not even close <laughs> Their websites often are, and there's a lot of good technology now for um, keeping your website compliant. It's, it's when you start getting into some of these documents is where it becomes much more difficult because of all the things that we talked about. Anything else? 
Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.